Hello, my name is Rob Edwards. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. And today we're talking Doctor Who Series 12, Episode 8, The Haunting of Villa Diodati. And the first thing to say is that I've watched a few YouTube reviews, as I tend to do with these uh, episodes, uh, and I'm quite surprised how many people have decided not to attempt to say the Villa Diodati bit. Uh, I understand the urge not to attempt to pronounce the unfamiliar words because I live in Finland and every word uh, is unfamiliar to everybody apart from the Finns. Uh, but Villa Diodati is pronounced how it sounds and is really fun to say. Villa Diodati. Villa Diodati. Villa Diodati. I don't know, just me. Um, I'm going to give you what I thought was good about this episode, the things that didn't quite work for me, but I'm going to start with a general spoiler-free overview of this episode. And my general spoiler-free episode review is... Whew, that was a bit good. I mean, not again a perfect episode, there were some things that on reflection I'm not so keen on, but generally speaking, it's another storming season 12 episode. The kind of episode which... Uh, I think I talked about it in, in my um, sort of end of series 11 conversation I had about um, uh, about resolution or the Battle of Ranskor Av Kolos anyway, is that throughout series 11 there wasn't really any kind of episode which really sort of grabbed me and went, yeah, Doctor Who. And I'm glad to say, you know, I don't expect that every episode. I don't, uh, from any TV show, particularly from Doctor Who, I don't expect every episode to grab me and shake me um but i always expect at least one during a season well to really kind of to really kind of hammer home the point of why i'm watching this show uh, and series 11 didn't give me an episode like this and i think series 12 has given me at least three spyfall part one uh, fugitive of the jadoon uh, and now the haunting of villa diodati uh, so yeah, I really enjoyed this episode. Now I want to talk briefly about the whole uh, Mary Shelley Eighth Doctor Big Finish thing. Uh, I am a big Big Finish fan. I love a lot of what they do. I haven't actually bought very much in the last few years because money has been a bit tighter. Uh, but back when I was in England still and employed, I watched, listened to a lot of Big Finish. I have a lot of favourites. Uh, and uh, the Eighth Doctor is particularly uh, a favourite of mine within uh, the Big Finish canon. And I have heard uh, the original Mary Shelley story, uh, which was uh, a one-shot in uh, the Company of Friends, uh, which actually takes place pretty much on the same night that this episode on the TV did. Uh, and um, also Silver Turk, which is the Mary Shelley Cyberman story from Big Finish. Uh, on balance, I think I prefer the Villa Dati, Villa Diodati. I <laughs> can't say it. Uh, I enjoyed the Villa Diodati story more uh, than Silver Turk, but I think partly because of the whole sort of timey-wimey wrapped up kind of minutia of it, uh, I enjoyed uh, the introduction to Mary Shelley in, I've forgotten the name of the episode, but in the Company of Friends uh, CD, uh, was a better uh, story. Sorry, my hair is doing that thing again where I need a haircut. Um, I, <laughs> speaking of, I, I was quite hoping that we would get some nod to the Big Finish Eighth Doctor stuff. Uh, within this episode of um, of uh, the TV show, uh, not a, you know, not a, an acknowledgement of that story or anything that would have been a bit too much to hope for, uh, but because the Doctor, the Eighth Doctor, has always been sort of described as Byron esque, and because of the direct Mary Shelley uh, connection, I had really thought we would get something uh, within this episode, and I was a little disappointed we didn't. Although I do know this is episode eight of this series. A coincidence? Yeah, almost certainly, but I appreciate it anyway. Um, so, <laughs> to talk any more about what I loved about this episode and what I didn't like about this episode, we're going to have to talk spoilers. So, let's do that. One of the things which I genuinely adored about this episode was 
a really small detail, a really fine bit of design work that they did. Uh, and that was the design of the uh, faceplate for the Cyberman. Because the, the mouth section of it was a little wider than normal. And what it meant was that we got to see the actor's teeth through the mouthpiece. Now this may seem like, but, but I love the way that emphasizes the other, not just the whole uh, otherness of his part cyber conversion, so that he's not really human anymore, but also the otherness from other Cybermen. I mean, apart from the sort of 80s Cybermen with a sort of perspex chin, that you could see their mouth move when they were talking, um, we haven't really seen this kind of, uh, this, this, juxtaposition of both the man and the uh, the Cyberman at the same time and I love that I thought it was really effective in fact the whole the whole realization of the lone Cyberman was really good I thought the performance was great I thought the variation of the costume was great I love the fact that you had the one arm which was basically sort of almost Mondasian style cyber converted uh, so it's still flesh and blood um, and I'm curious, given that his mission was going after the Siberium, and the Siberium seemed to go through hands, whether actually his the, the fact that he had one fleshy human hand still uh, was a deliberate thing on the part of whoever designed, uh, which you know whoever converted Ashad uh, into a Cyberman. Because I think they may have left that one hand so that he could absorb the Siberium, which would be interesting. Um, I think the Siberium is also a really interesting idea. Um, I think it's curious how the Siberium, which is supposed to be this whole kind of AI um, composite of cyber history and cyber knowledge and it seemed it didn't want to be with the Cybermen. Now, is that because it is something the Resistance created uh, as a, a guide to all things Cybermen and they were trying to keep it out of the Cyber hands? Or is that because, um, for some reason, the AI part of this sort of Cyber intelligence has rebelled against the concept of the Cybermen as well and is trying to get away from them? Uh, I think there's some really interesting story beats to be explored there, possibly. I thought the supporting cast in this episode were fantastic. Uh, Byron, I really enjoyed his performance. Uh, I guess the standout for me actually uh, was Fletcher, uh, the valet, a wonderful valet, so violent, um, who I really loved. Uh, and actually Dr. Polidori had a really sm a small but enjoyable role in the piece as well. Um, but I guess the big win for me this episode, the thing which really stood out for me, uh, is that we really got an episode which focused on creating an atmosphere. Okay, it is a relatively easy atmosphere to create. The whole haunted house vibe is, is not, you know, it's not earth-shatteringly original. There are a lot of beats that you can hit uh, to make that uh, atmosphere work. And... This episode played into them all. I mean, hell, we had the lightning bolts going on. Um, and that was a quick win, perhaps, but it was effectively used, and I really enjoyed it. I was genuinely, through the early part of this episode, just a little bit disturbed by it all. I mean, not like frightened, but just a little off balance, and I thought that was really effective. Uh, I thought that the... Um, the, the trap, generally, uh, with the um, uh, sort of perception filters ca causing people to go around on themselves and get confused and have an illusion of the house, uh, that was really nice. And uh, uh, the explanation of it, the fact that Percy Shelley and the Siberium were trying to keep people confused and baffled and away from him, was pretty effective as well. I'm less convinced uh, about why the Siberian Morshelli would decide to use parts of the skeleton. I, I, that didn't seem to... Because the, the, the effect was trying to keep people who were inside the building inside the building. So it's not like um, 
the skeletal hand was trying to scare people off. Maybe. Or perhaps the Siberian was just trying to kill people. I mean, that wasn't a Shelley thing, maybe, but perhaps that was part of the... Because he did say that, Shelley did say that some of what was happening in the house was down to him, and some of what was happening in the house was down to the Siberian. Maybe it was the Siberian that decided it wanted to attack the humans. If so, I think there's a really weird kind of what did the Siberian really want from this episode question. So, lots of really good stuff. Lots of really good stuff in this episode. Uh, things which didn't work for me quite as much. Well, there weren't many, and they are, they are all fairly kind of nitpicky. Um, the fact that we were sort of beholden to, uh, you know, historical reality and, and the message of, you know, we can't possibly lose Percy Shelley because of his words... You know, that applies to Byron, it applies to Mary Shelley as well. Um, it meant that the sort of core kind of writer cast, uh, if you like, within the episode, uh, couldn't die. Which meant they had to introduce two other characters, the two servant characters, for the express purpose of killing them off. Because we had to establish the Lone Cyberman genuinely as a threat. Uh, and... I didn't really notice this and during the episode. This is something that that came to me kind of uh, a little bit from some people, what well, they've said on YouTube about this episode, a little from sort of thinking about it in context myself. And it it falls a little bit strange, a little bit artificial to have introduced characters just so we had someone to kill off. Does it ruin the episode? No, of course not. A brilliant episode. Enjoyed it. Um, does it leave a strange note for me? Perhaps a little bit. Uh, and the other thing which I, I wasn't necessarily a fan of, I loved, the Doctor had some brilliant speeches in this episode. They had that she had the whole kind of, I'm not going to let anyone else fall to the Cybermen. It's not, if it's in my power to stop it, you guys are staying here because I'm not losing anyone else that way. was brilliant. Loved that. Great work from Jodie. Fantastic. Um, and I really liked her. The team structure isn't flat. Sometimes uh, it. Uh, I'm on a mountain in the stratosphere and it falls to me. That was a great speech as well. The one note that I didn't like was sometimes even I can't win. And that feels... That feels a bit kind of superhero for me. I'm a big fan of superheroes, generally, don't get me wrong. My debut novel is a superhero science fiction novel coming out in September, hopefully. Uh, but the Doctor isn't a superhero. I mean, a lot of the time <laughs> there's a lot of the trappings of the superhero. But that line just felt a bit kind of self-conscious, self-aware. Exacerbated by the fact that basically we hit that point twice. Once during the epic speech, and once when the Doctor realises she's going to have to give up the Siberian to the lone Cyberman. If we'd only hit it once, I didn't mind it so much in the, in the moment uh, when she realises she is going to have to give over the Siberian, that was fine. But it was the bit in the dramatic speech earlier on which didn't quite uh, do it for me. Um, I haven't talked about the companions, I've just not noticed. Uh, I probably should say a few things about them. Uh, generally speaking, uh, they didn't have a great deal to do. Uh, I enjoyed Graham's continued role as comic relief, uh, and the sort of subplot with him and the, the real ghosts was a lot of fun. Uh, I thought Yaz and her moment with uh, Claire Claremont was fine, workmanlike, but not bad. Uh, and Ryan had a few comments. Uh, actually, I Ryan had one moment which I really enjoyed, which is, he's going for a gun! He's going for a gun! He's going for a gun! Uh, I enjoyed that, uh, that quite a lot. And he got, to, he, got to, um, he got to pretend to be both Eccleston and Mickey with the whole uh, hand around his throat thing. Uh, so um, that was quite fun too. So not a great sort of standout episode for the Companions, but we had that last week. Um, this was uh, about... The situation, the Cyberman and the Doctor, and that worked. 
Uh, so, I think overall, that's probably all I need to say about this. Bring on the series finale, that's what I say. Uh, I'm really hoping that we tie up a little bit more of the stuff set up during this season. I don't think we're going to get everything revisited. I don't think we're going to necessarily get the Master, the Ruth Doctor, and Captain Jack all appearing in this two-part finale. Maybe one of those elements will be revisited and save the rest for season 13. Maybe. But I really enjoyed it. Uh, this episode, and it's got me stoked for the two-part Cyberman finale. Let's hope Chibnall can really bring this season home and end it on a high. Uh, thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed what you've seen, I don't know, like, subscribe. I, I, that, I've gone all YouTube. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, yeah, if you want to check out more about Doctor Who and me, click the box there. If you want to find out more about me and my writing, click the box there and subscribe with buttons or you know cheers <laughs> why am i waving